and my guest is a uh, is a, a blogger. She is a former teacher. She is an advocate, quite frankly, and she's a political an a a analyst. So uh, a whole lot, a lot of hats are worn uh, by Rhoda Barrett, uh, who carries on an internet uh, page there that will get your attention every time. Rhoda, good morning to you. Hi, good morning, Bishop. How are you doing? I am doing pretty good while you while while you settle in. I know it's a fast transition this morning. Um, one of the things that we are looking at is a meeting that is planned. A meeting that is planned for Tuesday between the Honorable Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago and the opposition leader. Um, you seem to not think this is going to go as smooth. Well, as smooth is uh, relative, but you don't think as though um, there's going to be an optimistic outcome. How do you feel about this? Well, if we... And why you feel that way is, 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 is better phrased. Sure, no problem. So good morning to your listeners as well. If we're looking at the track record of interactions between the opposition leader or between the opposition and the sitting government there hasn't been a lot of cooperation what i will say though as a preamble to the meeting that is meant to take place on tuesday with the agenda of about seven items is that it appears to be that the prime minister is going through the list of campaign promises that he has made mm. um on the on the platform you have the internal self-government issue with Tobago, which is something that he had said very early on he was going to be looking into. Yes. As a matter of fact, um, his bringing, w wanting to bring that back into the parliament is actually a little bit late because he had actually said that he wanted to do that within the, within the first year. Mm -hmm. So it, th th that's a little bit late. And that is also a long-standing promise that the People's National Movement as a party and even as a government under Patrick Manning would have made to the people of Tobago. Because since 2007, thereabouts, they have been pushing their particular, um, first it was a white paper, then a green paper, because you had a committee that had gone around Tobago getting feedback from the population about what they wanted to see by way of THA amendments. Mm. And then by 2011, if I'm not mistaken, there was a green paper that was put forward for consideration. And then the THA legislation, the whole amending of the THA Act became a political tool by the elections of January 2012 thereabouts. If it's not January 2012, then it's January 2013. But the t it was a THA election. It took place under uh, when the People's Partnership was in power. And the bill was tabled to be passed, like within a week mm. of the THA election. And the then Secretary, Gen well, the, Gen the, the, the then Chief Secretary of the THA, Orville London, had said that it was an insult to Tobagonians, and the, the bill was e eventually scuttled. So there is that. And then, of course, you have a, a series of other issues. The other six issues are issues that um, require a special majority, one, Two, depending on what the Prime Minister is bringing to the table by way of suggestions um, for amending or changing any of the laws, has the potential to tackle institutional corruption, mm -hmm. white-collar corruption, and then possibly um, violent violent crime. I want to stay with the second one uh, that's listed because this is something we have spoken about before uh, that the nation must have a very strong interest in because usually what happens with campaign contribution is going to lead during the tenure of governance of that party. So we always have a situation that is difficult when people put in money. It's a quid pro quo. You wash, your, you wash mine, I wash yours. So the issue of campaign finance reform, I'm happy to see that on the agenda because that is a real problem in the area of corruption. Well, if you look at the and nepotism, yes, of course. If you look at the government's legislative agenda, um, it, campaign finance reform is on the legislative agenda, but for all the way down to like 2019 or early 2020, somewhere thereabouts. So I'm happy to see that it's something that they have pulled up to begin to discuss now mm. because I think there's going to be a lot of wrangling on it as it stands. Um, we've had um, Dr. Rowley, when he was in opposition, say that he is on board with it, but the legislation has to be carefully crafted. I imagine that the legislation is probably going to impact on the rights of citizens, and so that's why a special majority is going to be needed. And maybe that's something that we, we maybe we should slow down and discuss that just a little bit, this whole business of special majorities. Mm -hmm. You make laws two ways in this country, either common law through judges or statute law through the parliament, right? And depending on how entrenched a law is in the constitution 
or whether or not it will affect people's rights, then you need to have um, a special majority. So there's a difference between a, 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 a standard uh, majority, simple majority and a special majority. Simple majority is what the government has because it, it's by simple majority they would have gotten into parliament, mm -hmm. right? They would have had mm -hmm. more seats than the other party. Mm -hmm. But there are certain laws that are so deeply entrenched in the constitution or may affect people's rights. And you need to have both sides of the parliament um, we support yes. the changing of that law for it to get anywhere. Mm -hmm. And I believe that campaign finance reform is going to be one of those laws. I also think that campaign finance reform, once tackled properly, um, can assist with crime in the country. So I was a little bit amused that the opposition leader was saying that she wanted to discuss crime but wasn't seeing crime on the agenda because I'm seeing crime on the agenda in a number of areas. Including okay. one clearly articulated called anti-gang anti -gang legislation. legislation. <laughs> yeah, so there is campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you the areas that I'm seeing. Campaign finance reform, anti-gang legislation, which was actually used, it was, it was brought to the parliament under the People's Partnership and they used it for a brief period of time under the state of emergency um, that we still have question marks about in 2011. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think that's the legislation they used to round up about 8,000 people and detain them. Um, and, and thereafter, the, well, the legislation lapsed, right? And the sitting government now w was trying to prevent the lapse and they, they want to reintroduce it and get support from the opposition to be able to tackle g um, organized crime linked to gangs, mm -hmm. which is, what, I mean, it's plaguing us, it's pl plaguing Latin America, you know, so we, we need to get a handle on it. I am also seeing... If you're looking to make changes to the Integrity Commission, then you're looking at tackling institutional corruption right. as well as white-collar corruption mm. because you're looking at public officials, um, not, just, not just elected members, but you're also looking at people who have been appointed to state boards, and you're also looking at high-level public servants. And we, I mean, in the issue with the, the Eden Gardens case that, that, that Afro would have just been, Mr. Raymond would have just been talking mm -hmm. about. The Eden Gardens case, the whole crux of that is pointing to people on state boards, <laughs> um, business people, and high rank and high ranking public servants mm -hmm. possibly mm -hmm. colluding to, 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 to defraud the treasury. Mm -hmm. Right? So to me, if you're looking to, to, to make amendments to the integrity commission, you are also looking to tackle institutional corruption and possibly crime in a particular way. Yes, conflict of interest. Conflict of interest. Yes. And mm -hmm. I would I would vote safe that the same thing could be happening with the other service commissions when he talks about wanting to to discuss service commission effectiveness. And the first service commission that jumps into my head is a police service. Service Commission. Mm -hmm. What's going on with the Police mm -hmm. Service Commission? Mm -hmm. How is it that we can't get an update yet about their attempts at headhunting um, a, a commissioner of police, a, a permanent commissioner of police? So, and to me, that's one of the greatest challenges facing us in terms of crime. I too was encouraged when I saw that on the agenda because at the end of the day whatever you talk about dealing crime you need citizen participation citizen participation will only happen if they have confidence in the institution you can only have confidence in the police institution if in fact you've got somebody who is not doing Hollywood and acting forever but in fact permanently in the position I concur. Yeah so when I saw the seven items like yourself I thought well okay this is interesting because it's tackling multiple areas um, I, I mean apart from him being able to see, okay, I am fulfilling my pro my my campaign um, promises or my, my the, the things I've said on the platform. These um, these seven items, if if depending on what he is um, preparing to do with them, mm -hmm. because we still don't know the details, right? We know that this is what the, he's pre he's preparing to discuss, but depending on what is being offered by way of amendments to the legislation, it may well be an interesting seven point agenda not to not, not not to minimize or, or, or leave all that last part there the code of conduct for members of parliament that is that is oh, this uh, that's reaching out in so many different areas and it is so important it's all part of this question of accountability yes accountability and transparency now i also think that there is a bit of a chess game going on here with respect to these um to these items most of these items are things that the last government have had a clear track record with um, and have stumbled on in, in some ways. So it will be interesting to see what the opposition leader's response is going to be. It's also going to be interesting to see what she brings to the table on Tuesday because she says she has suggestions. Thus far, 
you know, we what today is what the fifteenth of July there about sixteenth yes. mm -hmm. of July twenty seventeen. Whenever we've seen any attempt at collaboration between the government and the opposition, it's it's been antagonistic. Yep. Mm -hmm. So so we're looking to see whether or not the collaboration between them on Tuesday is going to be mature. And that is one of the reasons why I was encouraged at least, uh, albeit uh, kind of, you know, reluctant uh, um, to, to say anything, but encouraged at least to see that um, the, 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 the leader of the country has said, let me deal with the, with the representative of so many people, the head of the op opposition. Let us sit down and deal with this so we don't have to battle this out where everybody is performing for the gallery in Parliament. Well, we're hoping, I am certainly hoping, that uh, whatever proposals are made are in the interest of the nation and not in the interest of a special group. So to, when, I, when, when both leaders um, emerge from the meeting on Tuesday, I am hoping that they give a full account of what happened in the meeting yes. and let us know mm. precisely where they're prepared to meet and where they're not prepared to meet. As best we can, the opposition leader did say that something that is not on the agenda, in her view, is the question of jobs. We know that does not call for any um, particular majority in the House. That's not a voting issue. It is an issue that's a challenge uh, in lieu of the economics of the country where the country is. But does she make a very good point that uh, the economy and jobs must be discussed? Well, if, if you want to be discussing the economy and jobs by way of how it impacts national security, then I guess it can be pulled on. There is a link. The, yeah, no. there is a link in that way. To me, um, trade, industry, employment, those are issues that, that essentially fall under the remit of the government. Mm -hmm. um, those are they're meant to be government-centric policies. Uh, if she's got suggestions to make, the prime minister should be very willing to open he should be open to listening to her suggestions because remember she is representing 300 uh, about 300,000 um persons would have voted for her mm -hmm. so i don't I, I don't think that there's necessarily a problem with wanting to have that conversation with the prime minister but i'm just wondering why now because this, the Prime Minister has called for this meeting. For these specifics, for, yes. Yes, for and, these and, and, specifics. And, and at the end of the day, if we really look at it and you look at these seven items, I mean, they in fact create the environment um, that can assist in investment, which in fact can bring jobs. So that's what so, I was... So you're dealing with the situation yes. out so of these I was, agendas. I was thinking that if if you're looking to tackle institutional corruption, mm -hmm. if you, which is one of the things that... that investors want to see happen here if you're looking to arrest gang issues you know organized crime issues and if you're looking to tackle white collar crime then those are three criteria that investors have for wanting to come in here and expand the certain sectors yep. so there are ways in which why without actually saying i'm going to be dealing with um employment and without saying i'm going to be dealing with crime the seven points on the agenda have will have a domino effect on things uh, so i don't need to hear i'm dealing with crime i'm dealing with employment i am dealing with i when i see these things it makes it clear to me okay all right we're looking to tackle infrastructural issues that will mm -hmm. make it easier for us to start to do other things. An accommodating environment is going to assist a long way when it comes to investors that goes towards well, our employment well, we've, and so we've on. We've lost investment in this country because we haven't been ad adhering to um, stipulations on various corruption indices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if we if we want to get investment, we have to start tackling corruption. The 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 the, the tone coming um, from in, in in response, particularly particularly at the meeting that was held, the tone coming from the opposition leader, I found a little um, undesirous because, again, it was that confrontational situation, and I hope it does not carry itself into the meeting on Tuesday. I will say this. I think that there is a level of low-key, lazy, predictable politicking that's taking place. And, you know, I, I can't fault the opposition leader for, for wanting to go that way. Because if that's part of your playbook, and wh when I'm saying I can't fault the opposition leader, if that's part of your, your playbook, and it has been, it's established that that's part of the playbook, just mm -hmm. pretty much um, tackle the government on crime and unemployment, two areas that the government's hands are very tied, very tied up on because um, of what is going on with energy, What's going on with energy prices, and then of course, in in with respect to crime, 
energy prices has has kind of allowed for the black economy to rise up in a particular way and so that leads to an increased crime problem opportunistic an, um, 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 policy right. is what you're looking at exactly you're really Opportunis- opportunistic policies opportunistic uh, policies and mm-hmm. so the the opposition leader has shown us thus far that she's capable of opposing we know that she is capable of opposing but what we're not yet sure of is, is that she's capable of proposing you understand? Mm-hmm. So we know what the problems that she's got with the sitting government, but we don't yet know what she's bringing to the table by way of active leadership and decision making and um, problem solving. So I am not yet clear on how can Kamla Passad Bissessa, as leader of the opposition, solve the problems that the country is currently in. I we are hoping that, that collectively um, some agreement will be made in some major areas so we can move some of these essential seven items internal self government for Tobago campaign reform, anti gang legislation, difficulty with the judiciary, and that is a matter by itself. The Integrity Commission Service Commission Effectiveness and the Code of Conduct for Members of Parliament. Post that meeting is going to be important to see. It is. It yes. is. And uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the media does uh, in their questioning at that point. Equally, it is a uh, uh, the top of the hour, I'm just going to steal two minutes because I cannot have Rhoda here and not have her uh, weigh in on what I started the conversation with Afra Raymond, who was my first guest, and he was followed by first Peter Promel. Afra and I spent a lot of time on the Eden Garden HDC question um, from the civil case that is there. It is a civil case. Uh, do you see this being the door opener to other things to happen? I think it's a very interesting template, yes. I'm actually quite fascinated by the case, fascinated by how um, the case has been built thus far because you're looking at Trinidad and Tobago, the government, the Attorney General's office, having collaborated with investigators from the United States and the United Kingdom and following the money. Following the money is something that has been very difficult for us here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that, that is where op- us, us as a country up. Opposing FATCA and property tax. I think that's why we have opposed FATCA and property tax so much because it allows for the tracing of assets, the tracing of um, expenditure. And now you're seeing a situation where the state, um, they're using their resources to follow the money and mm-hmm. to be able to trace corruption and collusion. Because one of the things about this, this case, that the thing that I would say um, interests me the most is the role of the public servant. Yes. All right. The role that the public servant plays in allowing business interests and political interests to collide and shake hands and and, and to to scratch each each other's back. So the the, the mere fact that they have been able to trace the passing of a bribe and and, well, the alleged passing of a bribe and the the possible collusion of um, public servants. I think that is very, very interesting because the only way you can actually break the back of corruption here is when you stop it being facilitated from the inside. And when you talk about public officials who may sit on board or have some interest in private enterprise, the Integrity Commission, um, that is number five on the agenda and how that is operated is going to be in... The Integrity Commission as well as the, P- the Public Service Commission. So what, that's why when I saw the, when I saw those two mm. bullet points on the agenda, the Integrity Commission and the very, and the effectiveness of the other service commissions, I said, well... I want to hope that this means that they're planning to tackle institutional corruption because that's what those two bodies, those those two orga- those two bodies, uh, state bodies, that's what they're meant to be doing: mm-hmm. cracking down on inefficiencies, cracking down on corruption within the public service, and also stopping fiscal leakage. It is going to be a very interesting week. Monday morning is a question of liquidation. Tuesday is a question of cooperation. Wednesday is going to be conclusion because <laughs> a lot of people will form conclusions <laughs> after we are through with it those. Is, it is going to be a very interesting Rhoda week. Barrett, folks who want to um, follow you, um, have you set up that, that, that website yet? I know you're on Facebook. But, I've been, um, I've, I'm working on it. The website is not yet ready. As soon as that happens, you will be one of the first persons to know, but they can always follow me on Facebook. That's right. Thank you so much for taking the time to come in this morning. Thank you as always, for your input. I hope that you have a good Sunday and a good rest of the week. Thank you very much, and you know all the best to your listeners as well.